How are you guys doing? Day two, right? Maybe for some people, day three. Oh, day three. Ooh. Oh, I, <laughs> I can't do that. I can't. You're, I appreciate the effort 100%, but I don't know if I can do it. OK, grab the podium. There we are. So yeah, uh, so it's day two or three. Getting close to the end, of the end of the day. How are you feeling? How's your energy? OK, oh, that's pretty good. You ready to rock? Yes. Are you as excited as that person right there? Is anyone? That's amazing. She's so happy or angry at that sandwich, it's hard to tell which. Um, so thanks everybody for coming. Great to have you here. Uh, today we're going to be talking about um, sort of some aspects of project management, how to, um, how to sort of find the right size for a project, always a tricky thing. Um, and specifically we'll talk about some of our experiences and what we found to be the benefits of um, kind of putting projects into the right size uh, uh, box so that it can sort of move more quickly, things can, uh, um, it's easier to plan and roadmap our overall sort of project uh, pipeline, all that kind of stuff. So this is us here. We actually literally have a crab hat somewhere, don't we? You have a crab hat, don't you? So this is us. Uh, my name is Bjorn Thompson. I work for ImageX um, along with many others, some of whom are here. Hey Brent, how are you doing? Um, and it, I work very happily alongside uh, Gina, uh, who is now putting on a crab hat. Thank you, Gina. Very cool. <laughs> Hi, I'm Gina. Um, Valheda, last name, don't worry about it. Um, I work at Trinity University. I'm the creative director there. Um, I've got a couple of my teammates in the audience as well. And um, we first partnered with ImageX a couple of years ago to start taking on what um, we have come to call right-sized projects um, with our website. We underwent a complete website transformation about three years ago. We went from the Ingenix content management system and migrated over to Drupal 7. Uh, we launched our first page in November 2013. Uh, since then, we have kind of scaled back from having this gigantic, massive, redesigned project to thinking about it in very consumable, um, very digestible, you like the theme? Uh, chunks. So without further ado. No more dudes? All right. <laughs> do, we switch, do we switch hats now? Do you put it do, on? You? Do you want? Yeah, I do. OK. <laughs> this is the talking hat. You're not allowed to talk. It's really small. Sorry, I wasn't, didn't have the hat on yet. <laughs> <laughs> it's really small. It's hard to get on. OK, there we go. Perfect. OK. So yeah. advertising hats is more challenging, obviously. So. Um, yeah. OK. So. Uh, so what we want to talk about is some of the benefits, hopefully, is it hard to take me seriously with this hat on? Um, some of the benefits, hopefully, <laughs> of a right-sizing the project. Um, so considering the scenario, you're going to a restaurant with a, with a small group of friends. Do you choose a restaurant with broad scope, like all you can eat, everything's on the menu, a place that tries to be all things to all people, or do you choose a restaurant with focus, a place that seems like a, uh, a small sort of catered, well-executed well, uh, menu? So there's pros and cons to every decision, um, whether you're going with something that it makes everybody have, everybody has something for everyone at least, or something where we have a really more targeted scope. Um, so when we have something for everything, for everyone, everything's on the table, um, there's something kind of for everyone, if, maybe if not exactly what you want. The quality can be highly variable, is one of the cons. Uh, some things may be done really well, maybe the, to switch over to the project metaphor, um, maybe the content uh, migration goes really well, but maybe the, the sort of design process is less, is executed less well. They're just more moving parts, harder to keep things, uh, everything going at the same speed, at the same low quality. Uh, and also process can be less efficient. So um, there's waste and, and constant context switching as you're moving through, through the project. As, as we all know, especially if you have several projects on the go, context switching is a huge challenge. And even within a project, switching from um, you know, being in, in the early stages of the discovery to being in, in, into the, um, into the uh, definition and, and to delivery, there's so many different little, little parts to a you know, thousand hour or five thousand hour, pro hour project. It can be hard to keep it all in your head at the same time. So the catered, smaller, kind of well-executed menu. Uh, the pros are the quality of results, uh, reduced costs, hopefully, uh, risk and waste, which we found that, and less context switching. Con, of course, is you may not be able to uh, get the exact dish you want, because maybe one part of that, um, uh, of that dish is delivered at a certain point, uh, but then, to totally break the metaphor, 
Um, you might just wait six months for the next, next dish, which probably doesn't happen in a restaurant, but it happens in projects. Cool. So this is kind of our agenda for today, what we're gonna be talking about. Um, so in terms of making the case, we're gonna talk about sort of the benefits of a smaller project, um, how, to, how to sort of, um, how to plan it out, um, how to roadmap it, how to keep focused, um, thinking about ways you can sell it um, internally, um, and different ways you can sort of frame the project to get the most benefit from it. And then finally, we'll walk through a project recipe, which is a case study. And that's where our tortured metaphor, we finally let go of it. <laughs> but we love metaphors, as you can tell, and hats. Um, and hats. So um, in terms of just some sort of framing, what are the benefits of, of right-sizing or small-sizing projects? Um, smaller can be better for many, many reasons. Um, you can get going a lot faster, reduce bottlenecks. It's easier to often to get budget release. It can be easier sometimes to plan, plan projects that are smaller in scope over a longer period of time than a single big bank project. Um, smaller budgets often encourage prioritization and, and focus because you can't do everything in 200 hours. So you have to think about what can I achieve? What can, what can I, what's going to create the maximum impact for that expenditure? And when people need to build something smaller more quickly, it's very beneficial to put a time frame on it that's, you know, maybe a little compressed. They think differently. What can we live without? What is priority? And how do we, how do we best get um, huge impact from uh, a, relatively, a relatively small expenditure? So some of you may be familiar with this quote, uh, the biggest lie in software is phase two. Uh, we'll get there, right? We'll get to phase two. We'll do everything in phase two. It's going to be amazing. Um, so we try as much as possible. <laughs> Of course, we've never experienced that, uh, but uh, if you have, this will speak to you. Um, try to avoid sort of phase one, phase two. Instead, thinking about a series of planned activities that are distinct projects um, that are sort of operating in some sort of sequence, each with a specific business goal in mind. So we make a main project smaller by having individual roadmaps. Each individual roadmap <laughs> rolls up um, and takes its own part in the large overall sort of institutional roadmap or, or organizational roadmap. Um, each one has a defined focus, as I mentioned, that contributes to the, the overall strategy, where we're going as an organization um, and all that stuff. So here's just a, just a really rough sort of roadmap of some of the things that we've uh, worked on in collaboration with, with Trinity and with Jackson. And you don't even have to wear the hat. I'll let you speak oh, to okay. this one. Okay. Um, so when Trinity first started, like I mentioned, uh, with ImageX, we had a website in place. Um, it had some theme documents. It had a style guide associated with it. Um, but we had phase two almost every extra feature that we could have imagined on our site, which actually alienated most of our audiences. And we ended up with a website that was mostly for marketing toward prospective students and left out alumni, our internal community, our faculty and staff, and our current students. So in order to kind of make phase two a reality, we realized that we really couldn't take on a gigantic web project again. Um, there was a lot of headache. There was a lot that we uh, felt a little bit tested by. There was a lot that we didn't get that we thought we would get or that we got but was very subpar. Um, I will definitely mention that that was before ImageX came along. <laughs> um, so uh, when, we, when we started in on the partnership, we started with two large projects. Um, I'm calling them large because they were larger than some of the other projects we've done, but they were much, much smaller in scope and definitely smaller in budget than the overall web redesign project. With these projects, we focused on two of our key audiences. Uh, current faculty and staff at Trinity and current students at Trinity. So that was a site templates project where we allowed faculty and staff to develop sites custom for themselves and our online course of study bulletin which communicates with our database of record colleague. We moved then um, into an online directory project which allowed us to um, uh, again, access our database of record and bring in all of the full-time and grant-supported faculty and staff at Trinity um, into an online directory profile system that was then shared across um, all of our microsites uh, through the multi-site installation that we have um, at trinity.edu, which is actually what our case study is about today. 
And then I mentioned our academics redesign. So uh, this one is up next. Um, it has a kind of project timeline of about a year right now. And um, it will be our first step uh, over the line into the D8 migration. So um, this is coming up next, and it's something that we're really looking forward to. But again, it's just a tiny, tiny piece of the overarching Trinity website. <laughs> Perfect. So that's a great framing for um, so how we sort of plan projects, uh, how we think about um, kind of incrementally adding value and, and making um, sort of the site uh, speak to everybody over, over time. Um, so that's a really important aspect of it is how to plan it out. Um, because one of the challenges, of course, with like what we might call the mega project or the big, the big, the big bang project, which I'm sure all of us, have, probably most of us have been involved in at some point. There's so many moving parts, a lot of processes going on simultaneously. A lot of time, the, um, the thing that might lose out is sort of um, you know, shaping the content appropriately or setting up a, a good system of, of content governance. All, all those different things um, kind of tend to lose out. So as much as we can sort of make the project a little smaller, we can focus on doing a few things well. Uh, we can reduce overall risk by fully understanding and diving deeply into a few pieces of scope and really tackling those um, in, in full. Um, so another aspect of this is right-sizing projects also makes technology more accessible to, to stakeholders. If you want to involve someone from, from the beginning to the end, um, you want to make sure they're comfortable following along. And, and Gina, you have a couple of experiences with that. Yeah. Maybe you could speak to that. Sure. Yeah. Um, so I think what we really t are talking about here is um, oftentimes at Trinity especially, when we're involving um, other offices and other departments across campus on our projects, they are extremely highly respected and regarded experts in their fields. So we don't anticipate that a chemistry professor or a human resources expert is gonna know how to speak the language of the web, right? They don't know our terminology, they don't know our vocabulary, but they know that things need to get done and they know because we've told them that we need their help to get there. So by taking these projects and really focusing them and making them all about our audience and making them about our key stakeholders, we've really allowed them to speak to us in their language and we've tailored our language to speak back to them to really get that project to mesh together. about tying into the sort of overall site and project, project vision. So in this, in this specific case, we might sort of really focus on the students or really focus on the mission and get that piece right um, and really kind of dive down into that piece. Yep, yep. Is it harder to take me seriously with, with this No, one? I love it. Do you like it? Yeah, Great. I'm Thank next. You. So. Excellent. <laughs> so um, something we kind of alluded to a little bit, uh, but uh, sort of want to talk a little more about is smaller projects can kind of be toppings to enhance the main project or site to kind of continually feel this, this feeling that the site is growing, that we didn't just stop when, when we released, um, that's continuing to add value and getting bigger and better, <coughs> getting better all the time. So a lot of different ways we can do that. We can extend the site um, to address a specific challenge, um, and maybe that challenge we don't know about when we first release the site, maybe that challenge doesn't really come up until six months later. Um, so we are able to sort of, if we roadmap it over time, uh, address that challenge that may not even have existed at the beginning of the project. We can give attention to a specific group, um, so we can really make sure we get those, that alumni section right, or really make sure we get that admission section right. And we can test or release a, a new workflow. So it's a, it's a way you can sort of experiment and, and um, try new things with a little bit less of a risk profile, a little, a little bit less going on at the same time. It also allows for targeting, targeted marketing on the new feature. So if you're working on something where you're building out great functionality for alumni, or um, great functionality for students, current students. Um, it lets you sort of think about how am I going to communicate this this value to them, how, and you can start thinking about targeting that rollout to the, to that group. Um, how you're going to sort of engage them, how you can get buy-in from them, how you're going to communicate the results. It's, it has a lot of benefits in terms of um, kind of bringing people on board, getting them excited, and making them feel like they're part of the process. Um, and of course. Uh, with every project, it's easier to have satisfaction if you have those little wins, those little sort of Reese's pieces that you as the Elliot <laughs> in ET follow. Um, another tortured sort of metaphor. Uh, and it's easier to have satisfaction if you achieve those little wins with your stakeholders, if they're kind of on board and coming along with you. 
um, your clients and your user community. Because I mean, I think we all know about projects. People lose motivation over time. Everyone's excited at the beginning, uh, but that doesn't always last. Um, and faster wins, kind of keep people going, keep that carrot in front of them. Wow, that sounds like a, a terrible way for people to work. <laughs> if there's a carrot in front of you, you're not very happy, are you? <laughs> it's, a, it's a pastry that's in front of you. Um, so faster wins build excitement and help you maintain crab momentum. Cake. A crab cake, that's a great one. Yeah. <laughs> so with that in mind, um, I think I'm actually bestowing the hat to you at this point, Gina. There you are. Oh, my own crab hat. <laughs> I'm going to take us through uh, what we are going to maybe call our recipe for success um, for our online case study. So um, uh, again, so Trinity's uh, I think most recently completed and um, very visible, highly successful project uh, that we did with ImageX is our online directory. Um, if you want to visit it while you're there on your phones, it's at inside.trinity.edu slash directory. Um, stretch. Yeah, everybody, do it. Okay, all right, get the blood pump in, because this is going to be exciting. Okay. <laughs> so, um, one of the things that we found when we st tackled this project was that um, it was going to be much easier for us in a small chunk to um, really start a, over a very broad project of um, incorporating and including all of the content and design that we needed for this one specific project. We were able to really focus and tailor our wireframes. We were able to focus and tailor our um, Photoshop documents and mockups that would uh, then become um, additions to our theme on the website. Um, we also picked this project and, and, and prioritized this project because we knew it was something that was really important to our community. And because it was really important to our community, we had more people willing to contribute the time, the energy, and the content, 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 for this project. Um, because they were willing to contribute, they were also willing to make it more accurate. They were willing to meet our deadlines. <laughs> um, and they were willing to help us figure out when that content was wrong, what we could do, and what, how they could help us uh, fix it. Um, again, we were able to think through every phase of the project, through wireframing to the live production and testing. I should put testing first before production. And um, we were able to involve our stakeholders from beginning to end on that when, when it was necessary. Otherwise, um, they would have had, had been just kind of a little afterthought of, oh yeah, we need to test the directory, or oh yeah, we need to get HR or ITS involved to test the functionality here. So we were able to involve them in every step along the way. The end result was an online directory that is responsive, has a really robust search function, and my favorite part, has a really cool uh, custom designed API that feeds across all of our subdomains. Um, this was actually a make it or break it deal for us in terms of the directory because uh, Trinity has 12 subdomains across which it feeds directory information. Um, so we were able to take uh, the directory which lives on inside.trinity.edu and, and feed it out and feed the information out, the styles, the content, um, the features. And we were able to feed that across to our website, uh, sorry, our radio station, krtu.trinity.edu, our conferences office, conferences.trinity.edu. And we were able to share that information very seamlessly through this API. So how did we get there? Um, well, it started with a project schedule. And since everyone has 2010 vision, um, I wanted to point out on this project schedule that this actually includes team members from ImageX and from Trinity. So at no point were we working separately to try to achieve our goals. We were dependent on each other, and we relied on each other in order to make all the small goals that were associated with this project. In the back end, what that meant was that Trinity had to hold accountable all of the offices and departments that were a part of this directory project, particularly human resources and ITS. But because they were invested in the project and they felt like the project was part theirs, or mostly theirs really, they were able to uh, give us that content and give us that feedback, sometimes even before we requested it, which is like, whoa. Uh, <laughs> um, we rarely had to go back and say, hey, we're waiting on this, or um, hey, we need more information from you. So um, we 
completed before our scheduled deadline. Way to go. Um, uh, I think we were scheduled to release at the in the last week of December, but we released uh, in the second to last week of December. So we all had a Merry Christmas. Um, so uh, we gathered requirements as a part of the uh, project process, of course. Um, we did this together uh, via Skype, which is always fun. Um, we use Google Docs a lot and uh, comments and shares and things like that. Um, again, these requirements were uh, put forth by Trinity with the suggestions coming in from HR and ITS. But in the process, ImageX kind of came in and said, you know, hey, I get this requirement, but have you thought about this? Or hey, I understand that, that you want this to be a feature, but maybe we can rethink about it or look at it in another way. Because of this ongoing feedback, we were able to take it back almost immediately to the offices we were working with and say, hey, is this a good idea? Are y'all on board? If so, we're going to give it a check mark and we're going to move on. And it happened very quickly, usually within the same day. And at a university, that's, that's a big accomplishment. <laughs> um, I, so we actually built out some of our original uh, sketches with the help of uh, the offices that, that we were involved with and um, decide, you know, configured uh, things to uh, have priority or predominance the way that, that they would want them to on the site. Um, we also traded some things off when we thought um, a, a function wasn't actually going to um, be something that our users or our administrators would use. Um, one example is we thought that it would be a really good idea to have a super filtered, detailed search. And we, you were going to be able to check that you wanted to search by department or search by program or search by phone number or, or all these things. Turns out, nobody was actually using the directory, which was in paper before then, that way. They were using it to find generalizations, or they didn't know what they were searching for, but they wanted to understand who was in a department, who was in an office, et cetera. So we made a trade-off, and we actually uh, kind of took this out of the scope and inserted another department's um, filter into the scope. And it didn't change the cost of the project. It didn't change the timeline of the project. And it actually worked better for all stakeholders involved. I think had the project been a lot bigger, it would have been something we would have either looked over or just had to run right through because we didn't have enough time to sit down and think about how we might actually solve the problems that the offices were bringing forth to us. Um, of course, we did a lot of content planning, and I will emphasize that we couldn't have done this without the input of the other offices and kind of humbling ourselves to understanding what their needs were. Um, it, we took a back seat on the content planning at first while they told us exactly what they wanted to see. We then stepped in with our expertise to help them get it there. Um, we also did testing. When we actually tested based on our content plan, instead of just testing based on functionality, we wanted to make sure that the business objectives were met while we tested. So just a simple closed or open yes or no wasn't going to work for us. We had to prioritize our testing in terms of whether or not this was going to work for our clients. Really helped out a lot. They were able to help us prioritize. They were able to help us get it to the right place. I wanted to show a couple of screenshots. So everything tested, yay. And um, we have an online directory now, which I hope you're all playing with. Um, so here's the main page. Uh, this is what we call the directory. Um, it has a search uh, function. It also has that departments tab that I mentioned where you can go search through a department to find all the people located there. Each um, individual that is a part of the directory has their own directory page based on their username. This is a content type, um, and so the content type's uh, permanent URL is based on their username as a unique entity. So um, poor Vicky with a last name like Aaron's, she's the example on all of our things that we do. But <laughs> um, so uh, this is an example of Vicky's profile as a pretty distinguished professor. She um, has a lot of information stored in her profile. Um, part of the communication with our database of record uh, colleague, colleague writes a script via a program called Informer, which some of you might be familiar with. And that script generates a CSV file. The CSV file is then uploaded to the website once a day. 
and changes are checked whether there is a, um, an existing entity with changes, those changes will be made and updated. If there, the entity no longer exists, that profile will be unpublished. And if the entity does not exist, then there will be a new profile made. Um, some of these features are locked down so that you can't go in and change your job title. Um, if you just want to decide to be director one day, like you can't just go in and change that. Um, and then other things like your uh, bio or your publications or your subject areas that you teach are things that you or your uh, content editor for your department can fill out. Um, so I mentioned the API. This is one of the ways that we're feeding information across uh, to our different subdomains. So this is our main uh, marketing site, new.trinity.edu. This is the English department page. So you'll notice Vicky up there um, to the right? right Thanks. <laughs> Um, so she, uh, she's listed second, actually, because Claudia is the chair of the department, so that actually lists her first. We have a couple of functionalities like that built in. Um, and so uh, this is taking the information that's on Inside Trinity and pushing it out to new.trinity. Similarly, um, this is taking information from inside.trinity, but filtering it to a different section within Inside Trinity, um, the academic affairs meet the staff page as well as krtu.trinity, our radio station, like I mentioned. So this is our online directory, and it's a huge project. Um, it, it's a, it involved a lot of stakeholders. It involved a lot of security. It involved a lot of personal investment, people wanting to know that they, as humans, had updated, correct, proper information available online. Each profile can be customized as much or as little as the, that profile member chooses, and each profile can be um, added or subtracted from its office or department at will. So um, overall, we weren't just working on a project. We were working on a project full of lots of people. And so we really wanted to do everything that we could to give those people the attention that they truly deserved. So it took a lot of planning it took a lot of attention to budget. And then, of course, it took a lot of buy-in. So I'll turn it back over to Bjorn to talk about those things. Thank you, Thank you very much. Yeah. All right, great stuff. So obviously, when you're thinking about um, a project model, or whether you want to create a small project or a large project, or if you're aiming to kind of, um, if you're aiming to, kind of, uh, potentially off, introduce some changes to your organization and, and how you think about projects, how you plan projects. These things are really important. You gotta pay attention to the fundamentals. Planning, uh, budgeting, and buy-in. Um, so one of the clear, really important aspects of that is understanding available resources. And that can extend in, in multiple directions. If you wanna work with um, uh, you know, uh, the registrar, or if you wanna work with um, you know, the planning committee, it's really helpful if you know when their busy times are. Uh, what's a good time for them to have this project? When you know that, it shows a sense of a forethought that you've kind of thought through, what, what is it like for this person to, to, to experience this project? How can we make this as easy as, as possible for them? How can we make sure we get the attention that we need for the project? If there's a vendor or internal IT team required, it's actually helpful and good to understand and empathize with their schedule. What's a good time for that, for that external team to help with this? Um, is there a certain time in the schedule that we can make this work together? And the more we understand the overall roadmap, we can actually slot those times in a lot better. Also, the very important piece, understanding the budget. So one of the challenges when you're aiming to kind of right size or atomize uh, projects is, okay, how, how, much, how do we sort of plan for the year? How do we plan for the next two years? What does budgeting look like? So in terms of budgeting, obviously a lot of times when we're thinking about a project that might be happening six months from now or a year from now, we may not have a sort of a deeply granular sense of how that budget is gonna look. So we, we think of those um, further out projects like the D8 project you talked about as sort of t-shirt sizes, um, sort of estimating as an epic. So we have a high level estimate on the overall roadmap and then we get really, really deep and think clearly about, okay, what, what, what are we gonna estimate um, and how, how can we sort of get really, really granular with, with stories and tasks on the project that's in focus right now in front of us? Wait, won't this cost more? <laughs> but wait. Huh? Won't this cost more? Are you ready? Oh, am, am I ready? Are you ready? I can be ready. Okay. I didn't mean to interrupt you. No problem. I think this is the perfect uh, um. <laughs> <laughs> So um, 
this is a question that we got asked by our um, administration. Won't this cost more? Won't doing it all together wrap everything up? You won't have to reserve the available resources for the vendor uh, multiple times. You won't have to start and stop projects multiple times. How are you going to actually budget this where it makes sense? And how are you going to sell that to our campus community? Who's budget conscious, we'll call them. Um, so how we did this was we actually helped to break down the original giant scope web redesign project and found out that the, this is a like ton as like a metric unit um, of line items that we could actually go down and look and see what didn't get completed. Um, unfortunately, it was about a third of the project. Because of that, because we had to bypass, I mean, we've all been there, right? Okay, we can't fit that in the scope, but we need to move on. We can't fit that in the scope, but we need to move on. All these tiny things added up and actually gave us a less than desirable experience, especially on the administrative side for some of the, pro uh, some of the scope that we requested from that original project. So because of this, we advocated for these incremental costs that are way more compact and thus more controlled and, and in a more controllable environment. So we didn't have to worry about crossing out these tiny line items as much as we had to worry about delivering this package that would make the website more enhanced and have extra features. Um, in addition, um, by advocating for a smaller budget year over year, we're able to adjust our priorities as needed. Um, I showed a, an example of a roadmap earlier that we went through. Turns out the, uh, we had budget for um, the course of study bulletin project and the site templates at the same time. But th we only knew we were gonna have that for one year. However, we got to split that budget in half and we got to carry that forth year over year. Now we're not gonna extend a project out for three years. It would be uncomfortable, it would be uh, frustrating <laughs> and it would probably actually never get done. So instead, we take these little budgets that we have and we're able to fit something really nicely into them so that we can continue to request those funds year over year and we can continue to reprioritize what those funds need to be allocated for year over year. We also heard a lot, what about my part of the project? Um, this happens, right? Uh, if you focus on one audience, you don't focus on the rest, which could potentially be seen as a downside to some of your very important stakeholders or the people that you need to buy into the project. So we were able to expand our roadmap out and say, look, we're addressing faculty and staff right now, we're, but we're going to be able to address current students shortly in the future. The reason that we've prioritized it this way is because we feel that the technology will be advanced enough to give us a very robust and a very creative project with, without which we couldn't fulfill your needs instantly or immediately or within this same time frame. It often helps for people to hear that you'll be able to spend more money on them if they wait six months. <laughs> Um, so we were open and honest about our roadmap. We showed people where they were on the roadmap in terms of timeline, um, and we showed them where they were in terms of resources and budget. This often helped us say, you know what? You have a really good chunk of time between September and December where your office can dedicate a lot of energy and effort to this project, so we want to help you be there right along the way. This will give us the most successful project. Um, again, we were, be, we were able to be agile in shifting our priorities and move those chunks of projects around as we saw best fit other people's schedules, other people's timelines, and other people's energy levels. Um, so speaking of buy-in, one of the things that um, our office has adopted is we always release to the internal campus community a press release or some sort of write-up whenever we release a new feature on the website. We share this via social media, we share it in our internal uh, communication and email channels, and we get people to link to it when, whenever they're talking about it um, in terms of trying to bring it outside of the campus community. So this is a, just an example from a press release from our news center, but we're able to hone our marketing in on this one project and talk about all of the really cool benefits and features of this one project 
which makes it look really cool when you see four or five of those uh, releasing out in the same year. Like, wow, Trinity's website is getting really awesome and they're adding all these cool features. Um, little do they know, it's a secret part of our ongoing roadmap where we're shifting our priorities with our budget. Okay. <laughs> oh my gosh. If y'all have ever been in a session with Bjorn and I before, you know that we love group projects. It's so fun. Everyone loved group projects in school, I'm sure. You, you were always the people who had teammates who did just as much work as you did. Um, so um, we wanted to actually see if y'all would feel comfortable kind of talking amongst yourselves, find four friends or make four new ones. Um, to see if uh, we could talk about this a little bit so that this has some real world application to the things that you're working on right now. So because when you do a group project, uh, one of the many exciting things that can happen is deadlines. Um, so what we can actually divide people is just is just actually to know who your teammates are. Um, so you don't have to go and find them and just kind of struggle with that. Um, so we're going to try groups of four. Why don't you say these four here? Yep. These four here. Let's use our inside voices to be respectful of the rooms next door, please. Hi, sorry, really. The, sorry, just, just really quick, I know you're having a group discussion and I'm so excited about it, but next door they're having like a very intimate sort of like one person speaks and it's like bearing their soul and we can hear your whole conversation. So if you can just kind of use your inside voices, I would really appreciate it. Thank you. I think we'll chat for about three more minutes.
So we'll wrap up in about two minutes, and we'll give a couple groups a chance at uh, feedback. So feel free to, uh, if you have a few sort of conclusions to come come back with, that'd be great. For those of you who are actually in here. So we're going to wrap up in about 15 seconds. I'll give you a chance to just finish off your thought, and then we'll come back to the main group. Wow, that was loud. Hello! That was terrible. Uh, so we'll stop there with my interruption. I apologize. Um, and uh, we'd like to hear from just a couple groups. Just give us some thoughts on um, any, any discussion you had around a project that you could have broken up, maybe into a smaller unit, and some steps you might need to do um, to, to get that started. Now, asking for volunteers can be challenging. Um, but uh, any, any volunteers? Oh, here we go. That'd be great. I'll we won't make everyone something. talk. Uh, first of all, I couldn't hear you because you weren't wearing the hat, so I'm confused. Um, I apologize. I, I, I'm so sorry. I'll forgive you. Uh, so, he needs a hat. He needs a hat. Can everybody hear me now? Good. Um, so I've only been in this position for about seven months, and before that I didn't do anything web-related for 15, 15 years, so uh, bear with me. Um, but we, I inherited a project at the end of its life cycle that ran nine months late on a six-month time frame yeah. and about $90,000 short on what we got paid. So it was super exciting. Um, so one of the things I did a lot was look into this project and figure out what in the world is going on, and will I actually have a job in three weeks, or will we be out of business by then? Um, we're still in business, by the way. Um, 
one of the things that was a problem with it is they had a D6 site that they were migrating to D7, and they had a user base that had a bunch of functionality they were used to, and their user base was non-technical the same way that cavemen are non-technical. So they couldn't <laughs> deal with change. Buttons in different places, they were very confused. And the original site architecture was very convoluted and not very functional. So we tried to basically redesign the whole thing in one big swoop and say, hey, here it is. It's all better. Uh, the problem was we would make architectural changes that were intelligent and made things more stable, but you know the button was three pixels too far to the left and nobody could figure it out anymore. Um, and they couldn't see the new functionality partway through, so they would just freak out because the you know wireframes were weird. I think had we broken it into, hey, here's the feature, like for instance, here's your export feature that hasn't worked in three and a half years. It works now. Yes, it looks a little different, but watch what happens when I hit the button. Hey, the website didn't crash. It's a miracle. <laughs> Um, but showing them those, that progress in something that they can really understand, particularly for the office who's like every time someone tries to export something, we have to go call someone to restart the web server, gives them an idea of the benefits to weigh against. It's a little different. You're going to get some calls about people who are confused, but there's a, a big bonus rather than, rather than what we did, which was, you know, not efficient. For sure. Thanks for sharing. That was great. Yeah, it's, it's a, lot, a lot of similarities to a Kanban style where you're sort of um, deciding on your whip how many, how many things you're going to take in at the same time. <laughs> Great. That was perfect. Thank any you other, for sharing. Any other sort of uh, group, group thoughts? Exactly. Would you mind horribly if I picked on somebody? Um, I apologize for that. Oh, yeah, thank you. We have a voluntold person. Lovely. <laughs> 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 I always told my kids that not to share hats with people, but. <laughs> this one's clean, very clean. I have a giant head too, so it doesn't fit so good. Um, uh, so the, the question that came out of our discussion is, let's say, and this might be the case with your project, where I don't know if it was a case where they came to you and said, hey, we want to change our whole university over to Drupal. Or we want to, and we want to redesign everything, right? So let's say it's a large scale project. And I love this concept of going in, okay, we're going to do this part of the project, then we're going to do this part. Who's responsible or, to carry the vision for the whole redesign when you're doing it that way? And, and think in terms of like design and, and messaging, and, and if you're bringing in different people, how does that work? Yeah, I'll, I'll take that. Yeah. Yoink. Um, so I think it was really important for us to nail down those base themes and style guides and things like that first so that we had our own vision of what the website would continue to look like throughout the scope of the project, no matter how far it extended. Um, I think it's very important to have somebody on board who can, is, is going to be a very stable part of each team each time. Um, one of the things we've really benefited from is that we use the same uh, core developers uh, from ImageX. When we ask for to start a new project, we request the same developer and we request the same project manager so that they're also on the same page as us and they are invested just as much in our brand and keeping our project moving forward as we are. So that's not always possible to have the same uh, physical humans on the project the whole time. But if you can establish roles that have those kind of concepts and, and brand integrity in mind, I think you can hold accountable those roles for the scope of the project long term. And were you able to um, treat the overall redesign as a distinct mini project? You know, we look at it like that now, I think. N yeah. Now that we're past it, right? I think we can consider the redesign project a mini project, though it wasn't many. Um, it, was, it was something we wish we would have broken down into smaller chunks um, over time. I think that learning from that experience really helped us um, create the type of environment that we all wanted to work in. 
And so that type of environment was one where we were able to focus our efforts and be very intentional about our efforts instead of looking at something really big and hoping that it gets to the finish line one day. Does that answer your question? Sure. <laughs> Great. You guys are awesome, by the way. That was very entertaining. Um, I just want to say that like, kudos for you guys being such great partners. I mean, this is what we're going for all the time with our uh, the clients we work with. Um, but there's often pushback from all kinds of people, including like salespeople in my company. Are like, I don't want to sell a little tiny. I want to sell a giant project. You know, how did you get such buy-in from your stakeholders and from your company and all that? <laughs> this is Brent. Hi. So um, I'm that person at ImageX. Um, to be honest with you, it, it's it's such flawed logic. I mean, the partnership we have with Trinity, just from a, a business development perspective, over the last three years, has generated um, you know a fairly significant amount of hours and revenue for the company. Mm -hmm. uh, it didn't come all at once, but at the end of the year, you tally up your hours and you tally up where you're at. So. Um, it's a short-sighted uh, uh, mistaken approach in my, mm -hmm. from my perspective. There's, this is one of the most valuable relationships we have. We do countless case studies. We do countless presentations. We wouldn't have any of that had we taken a short-sighted approach. Sure. Um, so it's really set the model internally as well. I'd, I'd be lying if I said that we took this approach three or four years ago. We didn't. Mm -hmm. um, but now these types of small engagements, uh, building trust, building value over time, building domain expertise, understanding the brand, these are core principles of how we do business now. Yeah. Is there any number you can put to it, like a percentage savings you think this got in the end, you know, over what it would have cost with overages and the things The project like that? administration on small projects like this is significantly lower. Yeah. Uh, I'm not a PM by any stretch of the imagination, but, you know, a significant percentage uh, on the admin side alone. Mm -hmm. Just five, two cents. Yeah, and I'll, I'll actually add to what Brent said on that in terms of partnership. So I don't think Trinity would have come back to ImageX if we wouldn't have been successful in those first two projects, right? But now we look at them as a source of trust and we look at them as a source of education and I wanna hit that really hard. Every time we work with them, we learn something. This builds up our confidence and it builds up our, our workforce and it builds up just in general our entire knowledge base between the two teams. I'm not speaking for them, but I've heard them say before that every time they work with us, they learn something else too. Mm -hmm. So I don't think we would have time to learn from one another if we had these giant projects that were nothing but stress. Well, again, kudos to both of you guys oh, for, for figuring it out. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's a work in progress. Yeah, yeah. But uh, just real quick, I'll say on that, sorry to interrupt You're you, I'd like, like to ask a question. Is another aspect that might be a buy-in piece for sales or, or anyone who's kind of maybe potentially resistant, is knowing the pipeline of the partner that you work with and knowing where they're going uh, and having a little bit of a sense of predictability of their work is, is gold, right? Like knowing, um, you know, they, they, you're part of their plan and you're part of their plan um, definitely makes, makes life a lot, a lot easier. Sorry, go ahead, cool. I was just curious as to what project management tools do you guys prefer or use? So, um, like a lot of, a lot of shops, um, we use Jira primarily for, for um, sort of managing issues, bugs, um, stories, that kind of stuff. Um, we use actually Google Docs a lot. A lot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, th I know there's a lot of people who might look at that and say, well, you know, why, why isn't everything in Jira? But it's, it's sometimes very nice to be able to see everything in a single view, first of all. Uh, and, it, and also collaboration is, is, can be quite, quite straightforward and quite um, effective, in, especially in Google Sheets is a great, a great tool. Um, because, first of all, especially at the beginning of a project, you need to understand, oh, maybe we're cutting into the next session, are we? Oh, okay. Um, especially at the, at the beginning of a project, um, you need to kind of understand what do you, what's the whole picture here? And when you start throwing everything in Jira right away, it can be hard to understand um, the project as a whole. Or at least for me, I have a small brain. Um, so uh, those, those tools can really help sort of start that, that, that um, collaboration happen quickly instead of having to go find that comment from that ticket. Um, so that, that's a great tool. Um, we also use Basecamp a lot. Um, you know, some people knock it, some people don't. Um, Confluence is great, we're moving more toward that. Uh, but Basecamp is something clients understand, they can use it, and it works really well for them. Did I answer your yeah. question? Great.
summary, don't bite off more than you can chew. <laughs> that is our summary. Thanks for Kevin, everyone. Have a great conference.